if you ask respectfully, yeah. like if you're the one, that, you, you know, listen, DRock emailed eight times. There's people who like un- inappropriately stand outside my office and yeah. do other things. That's not gonna work if you're making the, the person uncomfortable, if you're not bringing them value. But if you respectfully ask, yeah. you're putting yourself in a position. Hey everybody, so uh, we, we continue our series of interviews here at Can. Uh, thank you for everybody listening on the podcast, anybody watching on video. It's been a, a, a good start. We're in day, I'm in day two uh, here and we continue the process with uh, a gentleman that I admire quite a bit. As most of you know, I rarely have individuals on my show that I'm actually actively doing business with because I always think it's a, a tough spot for them, it's a tough spot for me, for the audience, but what, what I've noticed over the last year or two, when you go macro or, or micro with it, at the end of the day, what I'm most passionate about is educating the audience, giving them insights, and sometimes there's a huge advantage of being up close and personal. And I've, I've seen this gentleman uh, push the envelope in the, in the short period of time we've been in the trenches, we've known of each other for a long time, we've worked with Pepsi Co, with Mountain Dew, with Pepsi in different ways. We're now very involved with Pepsi Blue Can on the digital side and this gentleman is at the helm. Todd, why don't you tell the Vayner Nation who you are, what your title is and then uh, we'll get into the show. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Todd Kaplan. I head up uh, the Pepsi brand in North America. And, um, and yeah, and I've been working at PepsiCo for a number of different years in a variety of different functions. As you know, we rotate around on the marketing yes. side and have done everything from Mountain Dew to branded entertainment to sports to most recently our water portfolio yep. where I, uh, we created and launched two new brands, uh, Life Water and Bubbly, and then now on, on Which Pepsi. Which is massive. It's, it's, it's massive. It's yeah. really it's, work. It's exciting. It's Todd, stuff. a lot of people who watch uh, and listen to my content are entrepreneurial, but as my career's evolved into the marketing landscape, I get way more DMs and emails and LinkedIn's about, hey, I may want to run a brand, or you know, I, I think you know this personally, when I talk about buying orphan brands long term, yeah. still working on mug root beer, so we'll talk about that off we'll uh, on that. We'll uh, camera. Uh, <laughs> You know, people are like, hey, I want to do that or I want to be involved. How did that happen for you? Like, what, let's go all the way back. Where were you born? I'm from Southern California originally. So I'm a, I'm a West Coast guy. I grew up in SoCal. A town called surfer Silvich. kid? Not a surfer kid, okay. but uh, definitely grew up Street, about... Like skateboard, I mean, sports? I skate, what? I do sports, I played tennis, I do like a lot of just outdoors. You're not a Baltimore Orioles fan. I'm definitely not no, like okay, Nick the yeah. Baltimore Orioles yeah, fan. Okay, no. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a huge Lakers fan, I'm an Angels fan. I know fan, that. You know, Are up, you... Yeah, comp- so. like, I, I, about I, the AD deal, can we just get a moment of like... Were you just super pumped? Super pumped for that. They did give up the farm, by the way, right. for him. But uh, yeah, I think they're a couple free agents away from a couple other pieces they need to make. Kuzma is what you're kind of like. Like they, they kept Kuz, they got AD, they got Braun, and I think they need you know somewhere on the point they'll do, they'll do something. You think Jimmy Butler's coming? I th- I've heard Butler. I've heard Kemba. I've, I've heard a variety of things. You know, I don't know where. But you know, you're excited. I'm, I'm excited at yeah. least. That's your squad. That's that's my how, squad. How old are you? Lake Show. I'm 40. Right, so Magic. Growing up, Magic, yeah, yeah. Kareem, and then you know Shaq, Kobe, the, the yeah. whole deal like that. So that's in my blood. basketball's number one for you? As far as viewing, yeah. And then? Yeah, basketball, and then I'd say... Um, Do you have any I second love, favorite team? It's the Angels, baseball. The Angels. And so I grew up about like 15 minutes from Anaheim Stadium, and so, you know, growing up again, mm-hmm. Angels, that was a bit of a, a tougher fan to be fun. Yeah. So well, Tim Salmon was fun. Tim Salmon, yeah, you can empathize <laughs> as a Jets fan. I can empathize. I can empathize with anything, <laughs> being a Jets and Knicks fan. I well, can, totally, and, yeah, and yeah, just like, you got all of them. Um, all, oh God, the, and all the good ones. I mean, you, you literally couldn't write a script of Clay and Durant getting hurt leading into this. I mean, season. that whole, it's going to be crazy what happens. Crazy. I feel bad for A, the Warriors, B, I mean, KD, this was, I mean, the, the Knicks fans, everyone, it just, that just blows up everything. It's so, crazy. you grew up in SoCal, yeah. you're into those sports things, what yeah. else are you kind of about? Yeah, so um, I'm a big... Were you a good uh, student? Were you entrepreneurial? Were you neither? Yeah, so entrepreneurial, it's funny you talk about that, like, yeah. I actually, and you probably don't even know any of this stuff, do no. I, uh... I have a very entrepreneurial knack as well. Like that's actually one of the reasons why I think, as I look at now, I see your, I see your, I see your creativity. Yeah. Like in the, like out of all the people we work with, like there's a level of creativity that is obvious to me, which a lot of times I do associate with entrepreneurship. So it doesn't stun me. Go ahead. But it's, but it's not just crazy. It's it's connecting it to just getting shit done, moving quick, making it happen. And so um, entrepreneurially, so I grew up in Southern California. you know, good grades, you know, top of the class, all that kind of stuff, but went to Northwestern for undergrad, which was an interesting case, you know, going from, you know, 80 degrees on the beach all the way to like, you know, sub-zero temperatures on Lake Michigan and Chicago. How did that end up happening? It, uh, I wanted to go to a big school, yep. uh, but not too big. It was like D1, it was like Big Ten, rah-rah, but still a very good school. Yep. Um, I uh, That was around the time they'd been in like the Rose Bowl, Gary Barnett, all that kind yes. of shit, right? 
And so I'm like, you know, I yeah, just wanted to the Rose Bowl. Uh, come check that out. But it was a, and it was great, and it's a great school. And so great listen, school. and it was great, great, great just school. to kind. Of, I wanted to also just go away for college and just yeah. kind of get out from all yeah. of my friends, stay in California. And yeah. so I went to Northwestern, and it was interesting. Is uh, I've always had this pet passion. You know, one of the reasons I'm in marketing is I'm just really interested in the consumer psyche, kind of going intellectually, and then also just on how people connect. And I've always just been interested in creative, as you said, kind of wired a little bit differently. And so looking at that, I got really into marketing. I've also been really into sports. And so that's where I'll get into my background in sports marketing. But when I was in college, it, the ironic thing is that Northwestern is the school that is esteemed from an MBA standpoint for marketing and Kellogg and all this kind of stuff. But as an undergrad, you know, the closest I could get was like I was an econ major. Right, mm-hmm. which I didn't care much about economics, but it was one of these things that uh, wasn't. And so I wanted to really get more experience in that space. And so I said, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start a business. I see a couple needs. So I actually started a business when I was in college as an undergrad in Northwestern. Love. It was called Ad Shop, and basically it was connecting the dots between. Um, there was this need on campus. If and this is not gonna totally date me, but if you go back to one of these college campuses around the time when I was in college. You'd have papers plastered all over the frickin' student union for shows here, this, there, taped to the ground, you know, it's a yeah, silo. Yeah. It's just very, the marketing for student groups sucked, yeah. basically. At the same time, you have people who are interested in marketing and getting into advertising marketing, and people want to say, well, what's your portfolio? What have you worked on? Yep. Connecting those two dots together, saying, huh, there's probably some people here who want to, like, get their feet wet. There's also a need to kind of do be more effective and target. And so we started this thing as kind of the first advertising agency for student groups on campus and the thing just blew up it started growing uh by the end you know by the time i graduated i had a number of people in this organization we were written up by the chicago sun times we had clients in local evans it, was, it became a thing and so that and that Did you started, pass it on to somebody so we passed it on and it, yeah. it became a thing and then um and then separately you know and saying like i'm kind of getting interested in this idea of just you know leading and on, being a more yeah. of an entrepreneur so my senior year i did kind of a more of a for-profit Yep. You know, kind of one that was this thing called the Campus Pipeline was about kind of targeting college students with advertising with local businesses, things like that. So definitely... You um, ideated on top of the original idea. Yeah, and yes. just to kind of take as yep. a kind of a spin-off yep. sort of thing. And so, um, but it also gave me a lot of experience and just kind of, you know, leading big teams. I've always been kind of very involved, even again in, in high school, leading big groups, all that kind of stuff. And so as you think of some of those things formatively and then also just as I think of the type of then experiences that led to my career, you know, when I was a junior, I interned at the U.S. Olympic Committee, you know, as sports marketing was kind of my passion. And so I was very, very At that point driven. of your life, what did you think you were going to do? You are going to run marketing for the Lakers? Like, how did you I did, it was It was more a matter of, yeah, like I knew sports was something I was passionate about. Marketing, I really started to really hone and mm-hmm. all that. And I'm like, and then this was, again, like the, not to date me, but like yeah. the internet, the the way that the, the job sites, all this stuff, like it wasn't as, as easily accessible. Don't worry, I'm older than you. So I know, so it's fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> they <laughs> still the, like me, so don't worry. Right. Okay, okay. so, but, but so literally, and it's funny, if you were asked my college roommate, he would like always tease me about this, but like my senior year, I sent out about 300 like resumes, the article that was on mm-hmm. all this kind of I sent out to every sports team, agency, mm-hmm. this kind of sponsor, mm-hmm. just saying like, Cast net, see what's Smart. up. Smart. Proactively, what's Wide going nets. on? Wide nets. Wide net. And then I got an did unbelievable the, did the response. Did the Baltimore Orioles reach out? Yeah, not the Baltimore no, Orioles. Right. Sorry, Nick. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, but no, but I got, I mean, I got a ton of, you know, interest and offers and as we were kind of going through it and it was just a really good experience and so I ended up well, do, you some, also, do you remember some of the offers? From there Blue? was a variety. Of, you know, we were talking to, you know, it was everything from IMG all the way to the, you know, every sports team. And a lot of the coming out of college, it's like also where do you want to move? Where do you want to live? Yeah. Going back to my SoCal story, mm-hmm. like I was freezing my ass off in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. And so You're I'm like, like, done with this experience. I have to get back to California. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the really interesting ones that came up was a sports marketing agency that was in in the Bay Area where it was called Mill Sport at the time and Visa International was mm-hmm, their uh, mm-hmm. their client. And mm-hmm. so it was basically to lead Visa's Olympic Games and all their global sponsorships. So I moved back to California after undergrad, lived in the Bay Area, uh, which what is year, awesome. Um, what year is this? This is 2000, that? class of 2000. Yeah. So. so Right before um, two thousand. Yeah, so right, right as the, the dot com yeah, and uh-huh. right before nine eleven. So you thought you were going to the paved streets of gold. A little bit, yeah. Right, so right. A little I mean, bit it was of crazy. That. Then. A little bit. It was, it was a little and crazy. And was it April two thousand one? It melted. Or was it April two thousand one? I always try to remember. 
Do you remember you graduated in that class of 2000? Yeah, had a the lot dot of people, com bubble already it just not, bursted, or was just, it another? It was just after because I had, yeah, I had gotten a I lot thought. of there was that's you know April 2000. There was a lot of people who were coming. You know, a lot of these dot coms. A lot of these people were reaching out at the time. Similarly, right, like looking sports, for top sports, sports dot com worth forty trillion. Yeah, there's this is that that uh-huh. was what was it the uh, the pets dot com soccer yeah, remember, yeah. the Super Bowl right all yes. that kind of stuff. And so um so literally right so. So as you're kind of on your way to graduation, the world is unbelievably frothy. Oh, I'm like, and all, it's like right now. Well, it's like, yeah, I'm thinking like, dude, Easy, that, we're yeah. gonna go get this thing. And also, it was April less 2000. Dot com bubble bursts. Yeah, you're going to the Bay. So you go to the Bay Area right as everyone's like frowning. Right as it's kind of like, yeah, what's going on out here? And uh-huh. then um, and uh, yeah, so I started with with Visa, uh, working for Mill Sport, but I worked in house uh, in Visa's headquarters down in Foster Got City. It. And Got so it. Makes sense. And it was really cool getting exposure. So doing everything from working on, you know, worked on the Sydney Salt Lake Olympics and the Athens Olympics were the main ones, kind of, you know, getting ready that for we it. did, and mm-hmm. and did everything from managing a huge on-site thing in Athens with all the. Uh, former Olympians called the Visa Olympian Reunion Center all the way to just, you know, the comms and everything in between and just it was a really great experience because also for that stage of my career being straight out of college, um, the team there was very senior level um, and getting exposure also at a global business because it was a global sponsor. She also worked on like Rugby World Cup and Huge. things that were going on in Australia yep. and New Zealand. All this stuff. It was really a great learning ground to were just Were you a cliche American being like, what the hell is rugby? Oh, initially, yeah. and then I had to learn what a try is yeah, and how yeah. all the, so, you, know, yeah. you know, the all blacks, the yeah. haka, and all uh-huh. that. I learned, I learned all that shit, uh-huh. man. So, it, uh, and it was a really cool experience just kind of getting exposure to yep. that. And so, um, did that for a number of years out in the Bay Area, and then straight after the Athens 2004 Olympics, um, came out east to business school, which is where I went to Yale. I uh, and in between my first and second year is where I discovered Pepsi, actually. Indra Nui, our, our former CEO, uh, was speaking on campus. And I was like kind of the, again, the, the dorky guy went up to her yeah. afterwards and said, hey, do you guys recruit? And I didn't think let, they did. She was like, maybe we let, should. You let's know. talk about the dorky guy. You've now <laughs> done it. Dorky. I know that. I know. That's why I'm jumping <laughs> in on it. You said it. Uh, That's you know, true. That's uh, true. Uh, <laughs> I view it a little bit different based on the stories and something I think a lot about. I said it yesterday, like somewhere, I don't remember. If you don't ask, you don't get. Mm-hmm. You know, you send out these 300 things. You go up to Indra, like I, it's, it's I'm also, I'm also, yeah, I'm also a person who can want, like, who lives in a world where I can see in people's eyes they want to come up and do something and they don't, and because others do, I can't get to that person. And, and D Rock's like, we're gonna miss our flight, and we run away. Yeah. And and I think about those <laughs> moments a lot. I'm like, wow, that person really wanted to ask something. They might have, you know, 99% of the time they're not necessarily saying something I yeah. I need or am interested in or, you know, but. The amount, I mean, D Rock emailed me. How many times did you? D Rock saw me speak at Columbia, right? Uh, thought it was interesting and emailed me eight times before I answered, right? And now is, you know, in the south of France. And so, and, uh, here we are. You know, and so, you know. That, no, but you're that, right, there's something. Yeah, no, listen, I, I, a lot of times when I'm doing this, like, obviously I love having you on a show, but I'm desperately worried about everybody listening right now. Oh, and, no, like, 100%. it's a second example. And I just feel like people need to, you need to ask, like, if you ask respectfully, like, if you're the one, you you know, listen, D-Rock emailed eight times. There's people who, like, inappropriately stand outside my office and do other things. That's not going to work if you're making the the person uncomfortable, if you're not bringing them value. But if you respectfully ask, you're putting yourself in a position. So Indra at Yale, you, you hear that, and, and, you were impressed by her, or or Pepsi was so iconic, or well, know, one a of mix re- of the both. Yeah, or- one of the reasons I went back to business school, frankly, was when I was in sports marketing. I knew that um, there would be probably a cap to kind of where I could go, what I could do. You got a taste given, of the landscape of the corporate taste, world, corporate and you world. said, if I don't get an MBA, I'm not going to be able to. Yeah, and it was and it was less that you know, in an MBA, you know, the advice I gave whenever anybody asked me about, hey, should I go back and get my MBA? Should I do it? I always say, listen. If you go to law school, you're a lawyer. If you go to med school, you're a doctor. If you go to MBA, you're a dude with an MBA. Okay. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, when you think about uh, business school, it's not about having the MBA that actually does anything for you. It's what you do with it. It's how you broaden your horizons. It's the networking. It's all the kind of stuff that comes with it. And so that, to me, going back to get it, back to my story, was about broadening my horizon beyond kind of this world of sports yep. and learning more about, you know, the financial stuff and market and all, all Plus the different Plus a place elements, like Yale, you're going to into behavior, all sorts of people. Speakers and that's yep. where, and so again, when I was there, it was less even about, I'd go to class, I'd do all this stuff, but I was there for the whole experience. And so 
when you talk about going to a place like Yale, where I was fortunate enough to go, and the speakers, the people, it Absurd. was out of control. And so going all these things, and I would make the most of just, to your point, of just go to all, attend all these speakers, go to all these things. I'd go, I led a trip to Japan with a, a group of my friends there That's where awesome. the, the people helped. We connected with the head of Nissan and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like it's... It, the axe, the brand. It was, one, the it was a yeah. very, it was a very. And plus, you know, Ivy cool. League basketball is always a fun competitive kind <laughs> right. of like league as well. Right, so. right. So, so that was really cool there, and ended up uh, ended up interning for Pepsi in between my first and second years. And the irony was, I had wanted to um, get go to Pepsi or a big CPG to kind of get beyond sports marketing yeah. and just broaden my horizon. Yeah. And guess where they placed me for my intern? Sports, in sports group. Of so for a guy named uh, John big, Galloway. Yeah who is a, was an iconic guy yeah. at the time and was kind of one of my mentors who brought me into Pepsi and we, you know, got along like, you know, two peas in the pod and just made the most. And so I came back full time and... Um, you know what's funny about that story, just for everybody, a lot of the things that I tell our... My brother AJ and I have a sports agency and a lot of the things I tell kids before the draft is, you know, they're like, I want to go second round, I want to go third round. I'm like, yeah. bro, I'd rather you go fifth round than second round and, and have totally. the person ahead of you in a depth chart be the kind of veteran who actually wants you to succeed yeah. than you going second round and having a guy in the depth chart who is worried about you and is undermining you and yeah. is teaching you nothing or you have bad coaching. Like, you know, it's unbelievable how much that matters. Yeah. No, and, and that's it, what you had in this internship. It totally is. I had a, had a great kind of mentor that, uh, you know, definitely looked out for me. And also, I will tell you, the intern program at Pepsi, it's, it's kind of like they, they do this thing every year called the Intern Bash, which it, it was like kind of, you know, they make the interns, that, you know, have a lot of fun and do silly things. And I'm still convinced back to your idea of taking the initiative, you know, and I, I'm someone who likes to put myself out there. So when I was the intern this year, they had a, uh, we had to do a 1980s fashion show for the entire, <laughs> for the entire company out at, outside and purchase, right? And so everybody, you know, someone's dressing up like Madonna, someone's yeah. dressing up like, you know, Miami Vice. I decided it's a good idea to do Tom Cruise and Risky Business. Basically, wow. Heidi Whitey's white shirt, you candlestick. Went there. You went there. And did the, I, I went there. And quite literally, I still get asked by people about, I'm convinced that's the only reason I got hired. I believe that. I believe that, um, um, Literally, way, it, but way. that's the kind of thing, it just put yourself out there. It's like, you know Todd, what, I'm having, way, I'm having a great time. Literally, somebody that worked at Vayner for 10 years, who's now my partner in Empathy Wines, yeah. Nate, single-handedly got his job because he super duper duper tried hard during <laughs> volleyball as an intern in Vermont when we did a company offsite. Yeah. The way he tried to win is why I like advanced his career. Yeah. I believe in that shit. That's exactly right. That's but it, it has so to be authentic to you, right? It like, has to be, like you're yeah, that yeah. kind of character. Yeah, I'm, like, a, I'm like, a ham. The yeah, reason totally. I'm saying that's right, but that's why I'm saying like to everybody who's listening right now, if you're like, oh, okay, like I'm an internship right now, I'm gonna break out this year. No, no, and no, you're no, super no, no, no. introverted. Don't do that. It's gonna come across <laughs> super awkward. It, it, authenticity well, that, is like the core of all this stuff. And to, and to that point, you know, I, you know, to the point, and we can get to kind of core skills and all that stuff. But I, I do a. Uh, a course at PepsiCo on on storytelling. I'm a big proponent of yeah, storytelling yep. and how to tell a good logical story and all this stuff. But uh, that's one of the big misnomers is everybody feels that you know to tell an effective story, to present at a big conference, yeah. to do anything, you got to be somebody who you're not. Yeah. The key is be yourself. 100%. Just be a hundred percent authentic to you and just own it. You know, don't try to be what you're not and just I'm figure sure out we, how to lean into it. You know what? That. To make this point, I'm sure for you and I, where we share a lot of this, you know, charisma over the time, like. There's a lot of times where we knowingly know some of our energy is detrimental given the context. Totally. And you try to tone it down, but even that is not gonna necessarily be who you are either. Totally. I mean, there's places where, on stage, it's great that I'm like cursing, whatever, but, but on, you know, in small meetings, sometimes like that, it's just like, that's not gonna play. Yeah. But I'm still gonna do it because that's just like most comfortable. Let's, you let's segue. Yeah. <sighs> so. I'm fascinated by Challenger brand being a number, you know, you are not, you know, some of the stuff that you're getting heralded for in the last couple hours here announced, some of the cola stuff, like this, the Pepsi challenge is one of the most iconic things of all time. Like nobody listening right now is confused that Coke, Pepsi mm -hmm. uh, is like some of the most interesting banter in business. Yeah. Uh, there's not that many places where you have such a dominant one and two that it's almost fun to watch Ali and Frazier fight. Yeah. But you happen to find yourself in that world. 
How is that? How do you think about that? Yeah. How, have you, when you're talking to predecessors that have run the business, have you leaned more into, I'm gonna punch you in the face? Have others been more passive? Have you been more aggressive or vice versa? When you, when you kind of got signed up for the gig, mm-hmm. moving, like what was your initial thoughts versus yeah. the reality? I'd love to get a state of the union of all yeah, the stuff. Yeah, no, about. totally. Because it's, it's interesting. Coming into this role on Pepsi, um, from my previous role, which was, again, also very entrepreneurial, starting new brands on water and yes. that sort. Coming from that environment into the mothership, yes. right? This is the all name on the eyes. door, all eyes, lots of when you're lots innovating, of feedback, lots yeah. of lots When of you're innovating on water, people are curious, but not watching every sneeze and crossing Correct. every T. You go to Blue Can, and I'm painting the picture for everybody listening. Yeah. They're, uh, by the way, for everybody listening, as an innovator on Vayner's side, I always tend to like to work on things that are a little more under the radar because it could be far more creative. Work We tend to push the envelope in general as mm-hmm. a business model. You get on something like this, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's watching. That's right. And a lot of marketing is subjective bef- before the reality kicks in of the results of the business. So you deal with a lot of chatter. It's almost like it's almost like being an NBA player and having Stephen A and Chris Bassard and totally. everybody else watching and listening and commenting. It's a two On cents every. machine. It is. No, totally. And that's and that's so one of the biggest things is you gotta work out in public a lot more than kind of, you know, you can kinda of yes. just, you know, do do your thing on these other brands a little bit more. But I'd say um, from a business challenge, you know, it's a completely different thing. On one end, you're coming into this um, iconic brand that is, you know, got this great heritage and pop culture, music from Britney Spears to the Super Bowl to Michael Uncle Jackson, Drew, all that, stuff. all that stuff, right? And it's, it's got such a great heritage. Um, at the same time, uh, the current landscape around the consumer world has changed, and, and the consumption of the category has evolved, and all of that stuff. And I'd say. Um, you know, the problem to solve as I quickly assessed it was it's not, Pepsi doesn't have an awareness issue, it doesn't have a trial issue, it has, you know, relevance is what we really needed to focus on. And really, that's where I really hunkered in really quickly of saying, you know, the main thing we got to get is this brand needs to be culturally relevant. At the end of the day, this brand's been at its best when it's those kind of things that we talked about. But is that, that the, is I apologize, is that the kind of stuff that, and I thought this was a very smart strategy, I, and we didn't work on this for context because we do digital stuff, this is more of the TV stuff, but everybody who listens knows how much I'm obsessed with Super Bowl. Yeah. Is that the kind of stuff that leads to having Cardi in yes, the Super yes. Bowl Yes, so let me, so I'll give some context on that. And so, one of the things I wanted to really address is this idea of a challenger mindset. Yes. And challenger, I think, one of the things that, one of the misnomers is people think challenger just means Oh, well, you're number two, or oh, <laughs> you're whatever. Like, that's challenged. That's not challenger, right? Um, the idea of being a challenger is a mindset and a mental approach to kind of disrupt, think of things a little bit differently in an industry, take them flipping on its head, and be a little bit more unapologetic and more, more confident in kind of your approach and how you do this. And so, excuse one me for one second to add a little color commentary. All fine and dandy for a lot of us listening when your business is tiny and you're an entrepreneur and you don't have a board and, you know, you can get there. Having a challenger mindset when you have a brand the size of Pepsi, which is probably bigger than 99% of the other consumer brands in the world, a little bit more tricky. Yeah, no, definitely a little <laughs> bit more tricky. And so, um, one of the first kind of I, things of, as being a challenger brand is you really got to acknowledge your place in the world and have a kind of a healthy self awareness for your brand. And, you know, I, you know, just even culturally, and we can talk about, you know, culture and all that, which I'm a culture junkie as well, but um, I don't like things that feel like, advertising, right? That's like very, you know, this idea of brands coming out with brand messages. I'm speaking to you as a brand, whatever, without any cultural acknowledgement of my place in the world, things I care about, whatever that is. And so starting from the standpoint of Pepsi has had this, um, one of our most frequent consumer interactions that we're most famous for is probably not our most proudest moment. And it's the situation when you go into a restaurant that pour Pepsis, somebody orders a Coke, and Quite literally, the server apologizes for serving is Pepsi. Is Pepsi okay? Is Pepsi okay? How freaking horrible is that? That is what, I mean, it's a great that is, insight. And, and every single one of us has gone through that experience yep. multiple times. We've been there, you've ordered one thing, someone, a friend has ordered it, all that kind of stuff. And so it's like, okay. And, and if you look online, there's, I mean, meme cultures have an yes, heyday with yes. this. People say, is Pepsi okay? Is Monopoly money okay? You know, and there's all these, you know, memes yeah. with Kevin Hart and all this kind of And so, saying what if what if we took that insight because it is super relatable who hasn't been in a situation where they can connect the dots to that own it and say yeah 
that's how people see us, but then let's have some fun with it. It's Pepsi, yeah, and it's more than okay, and have fun with it, but then do it in a Pepsi way, which again, bring in the pop culture yes. nature, so we get mm -hmm. Cardi B, yep. okay, right? Yep. You get Lil John, okay, right? And then Steve Carell, and you have this wonderful kind of dynamic where we're just like, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. There's a fun little way, and you can get the Super Bowl-ness, which we should also sure. talk about. I'm a huge believer in the Super Bowl as a, as a great platform to go bigger and broader and, and all that stuff. And so that's, that was kind of the genesis of that whole concept, that um, we really think, um, you know, it, it, it really helped kind of reframe the discussion for Pepsi around this challenger mindset and put us on the map. Combined with that, then this past year, the Super Bowl, you know where it took place in Atlanta, which was like a gift from the gods. Of given course, our competitor yes. is Atlanta, and it's not just because like oh, company to company, we're going to have a little yep. corporate thing. Culturally, in Atlanta, Coke like runs in the veins of people. Like it is like a emotional it pours out of the faucet. It is literally a deep rooted thing, and so saying okay. We normally go into a market, and I didn't say it like the okay. I was just saying, okay, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but okay. We're gonna go into a Super Bowl market. Typically, you know, we're the, we're the sponsor of the NFL. We go into Super Bowl. We beat our chest. Say, official sponsor of the Super Bowl. Oh, uh, you know. I'm like, we can't just like run the same play. We gotta have a little little fun with this. And so to say, okay, if there's Pepsi signs all over Atlanta, these Atlanta folks are gonna be like, what the hell mm -hmm. is going on? And so what we ended up doing is leaning into that cultural insight and saying, we we bought out a home over the entire city. And so we had builders that said. Pepsi in Atlanta, how refreshing. Hey Atlanta, thanks for hosting. We'll bring the drinks. Mm -hmm. You know, and had a lot of fun with these very Pepsi centric forward things that quite literally just putting up the out of home alone generated hundreds of millions of earned media impressions. People writing stories, people were tweeting like, what the hell? I feel like I'm getting invaded right now, you know? And th at the time, you know, even who was about to be in the Super Bowl, all the people in Atlanta, they thought the Saints were coming in. They thought, oh, they're like, what the <laughs> hell is going on here? Um, Pepsi in Atlanta, and they got a lot of interesting buzz. And so <clears throat> seeing all that a couple weeks uh, before the Super Bowl and all the traction that was getting, we're like, all right, well, we want to make sure people know we're not being mean-spirited. We all did it on the up and up, it means whatever. And so we're like, we got to... Let everybody know that, hey, we're, we're grateful for you um, to host the Super Bowl. And so we came up with this concept called the Cola Truce. And it was a, it's a pretty fun, also kind of instigative challenger thing we ended up doing where essentially for anyone who's been to Atlanta, the world of Coke is this iconic kind of yep. you know, landmark they have. It's a museum of all the yep. things and they host big events and whatever. And right out in front of the world of Coke is a statue of their fan, their founder, John Pemberton. And he's holding out a glass of Coke, greeting you as you walk in, you know, sharing a Coke with the world and, and all that great stuff. And so quite literally we said, what if we uh, created a statue of our founder, Caleb Bradham, and we got them to, you know, have a nice little cheers moment and, uh, and celebrate and declare a cola truce. Uh, wouldn't that be a cool thing? And so what we ended up doing is we, we built this statue um, in record time, by the way, because this was just a couple weeks out of the Super Bowl, and yep. it was just a mad dash to even get this thing done. And, uh, and we said, but rather than just do it, we're going to engage them. We've never even, social, back to social media, we've never engaged really Coke on mm -hmm. social media. Mm -hmm. I know like that's commonplace for brands. Yep. Wendy's looking at yep. all these brands. Um, so we said, hey, Coke, um, you know, we'd love to, we, we tweeted a picture. We think we should get together, you know, whatever. And Coke, Coke had just launched this campaign called Together is Beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's all about unity, togetherness, and I'm like, this is perfect. So it's like a movie. Meanwhile, in Atlanta headquarters, we're going to do Together is Beautiful. Yeah, they're they're like, together is Beautiful, peace on earth, yep. we're all coming together. I'm like, perfect. We believe Together is Beautiful too. Why don't we come mm -hmm. hang out? And we show them this picture of the glasses. Mm -hmm. Coke tweets us back and says, of course, welcome to Atlanta, Together is Beautiful. Then we tweet them back with a picture of the full statue in the back of a Pepsi truck saying like, cool, we're on our way. We don't hear anything back from yeah. them. And then what we ended up doing is we go there to the World of Coke. We documented this whole yep. thing. Um, and we walked in and, uh, and quite literally we said, hey, Coke just invited us over here. We allow, you know, can we get this yep. cola? We're trying to declare a cola truce. Um, and they absolutely kicked us off. They're like, you can't be here. We were told, instructed not to let you on the property, blah, 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 blah. And we're like, okay, okay. And we, we anticipated some yep. of this. And so earlier that morning we had snuck in and actually gotten the picture <laughs> ourselves. And so, you know, for the, the 10 minutes we could get in there, get the photos or whatever. And so what we ended up doing is we tweeted the photo anyhow and said, hey, we stopped by, looked like you guys weren't that into it, doesn't feel very together, it's beautiful, <laughs> uh, but it's okay, we stopped by earlier this morning 
And <clears throat> then we actually flipped it and said, hey, you know what? We want to declare a cola truce for the day. Um, anybody who tweets the hashtag cola truce and a picture of them cheersing a Coke and a Pepsi online, we're going to donate a meal to the city of Atlanta to people in need. To all again, this is all yep. about being gracious yep. to our hosts and saying, hey, Atlanta, we get you. We want to do yep. some good for you. And so really um, the thing instantly trending took yep. off like a wildfire got a ton of buzz earned media social and uh and was really really fun and exciting and people were tweeting pictures of them cheersing people making dance routines up you know it, it just became a whole thing and so all that together with the pepsi okay with the out home just was a really fun just kind of re-energize a lot of the brand you know just out of yep. one of our biggest moments the super bowl so as a human, where, what apps, what, co- like, nep- talk to me about Netflix, social, this is Todd the man, forget about the executive. Yeah. Netflix, social media, like, what, what are your consumptions right now, knowing that you love culture? Yeah. Obviously, we're wrapping up here, and so we, we'll, we'll have to do a part two at some point about, like, culture hacking and what's yeah, happening. Yeah, I want to get it. in on that for sure. But for you as a man, like, what, Instagram, Snap, you know, what Netflix shows do you watch, if any? Yeah, Netflix is it's funny. We um I I haven't gotten as into kind yep. of like the full on binging because right now when Hulu, I get home, Amazon Prime anything or you just like when you get home you watch sports. I, I typically watch a lot of live sports. Yeah, and I get a it. lot of ESPN. I'm that the kind same, of by stuff. the way. I have no big um, show either. I definitely will will dig around on Netflix, but I'm not at I haven't been as. Are addicted you a documentary to a guy? I can get into some of that stand stuff up. now and again. Stand up, I definitely like a good stand up every now and again. Um, movies, I watch a lot of movies. Um, what I about social wise? <clears throat> Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Social wise, you know, I think I think Twitter, I think Facebook, Instagram, all, all the kind of the standard kind of things I'm 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 interested in. I'd say, but I'm not as um, active. You know, for yep. me, uh, and it's interesting. Like I'm. I'm not as much of a live in public kind of persona, yeah. uh, you know, just, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But I definitely, it's funny, I consume a lot of them, yep. uh, but I'm not necessarily out there, you know, so I consume a lot of Instagram, but I actually you, don't post. You really. know what's funny, I don't know if you know this, you know, I don't share any of my family stuff at yeah. all. Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> and both of my main careers, both wine and now marketing social media, yeah. I'm com- I know this, because I know myself, obviously, I, I, I never drank beer or alcohol in college or high school. And had I not had a family wine business, I don't know if I have ever would have drank alcohol in my life. I mean, if you go through high school and college not drinking it, it's not in your culture. Um, you know, and obviously I was born in the Soviet Union and everybody was dying from yeah. vodka, so my mom like really <laughs> demonized alcohol. And then social, like, I'm pre- I, I get it. I, I'm pretty convinced that I would currently would be, a, if I was a, doing something else in my life, would not be, I would consume, yeah. but I would not post, which probably sounds yeah, funny, but if you look at the content I put out, it's my business life. It has <clears throat> nothing to do with my well, life. I also just think it's such a fascinating, even just going back to studying the human psyche and why yeah. I have like, you know, we have friends and people we know and who yeah. just, they post everything they're eating, everything, whatever. And my kid won a baseball game all the way up to everything. And, yep. and at the end of the day, like, and that's all good and fine. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's what a lot of it's for, for me. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'll post on like, hey, happy birthday, yeah, yeah, that of course, kind of stuff of or whatever, but I'm, I'm not as, I... I'm thrilled they post because the one thing that clearly we share is I got to listen a little bit more is I want to know why they're putting up the video of their kids scoring a touchdown. I want to know why they're sharing, you know, their, their, their Disney their trip. Their... Um, that, that's how I basically come up with all my ideas. Totally. Well, and there's just so much rich insight into kind of the, the human behavior of why and how people are sharing all these things, even back to this uh, summer campaign we just launched with Instagram, right? Summer yep. Jam, which you know about? Yep. Where we've created 250 AR filters, you know, and they're all attached to Pepsi bottles. The core inside of, I mean, Instagram is probably the epitome of this kind of like, look how great my life is kind yep. of sort of behavior where everyone's seen that iconic photo of their feet on a lounge chair by the pool yep. with the rosé next to yep. their side, right? And it's Empathy basically- rose. Right, empathy <laughs> rose. There you go. We gotta gotta get that in there. Let me get that but it's um and really capitalizing it, saying yeah, well, if unapologetically, how do you kind of you know amplify it with these AR effects and stuff? But it's there's just so many little nuggets like that. Just even just looking around, mining on social media to really um, let's wrap you know, up with one from, thing I, yeah. I I like watching you, your team dynamics. You know, I I do see you know the the entrepreneurial spirit. Like I have this quite a bit as a leader as well, which you get a lot of the motivation, the rah-rah, the, the fire, the thing. The other thing you get with characters like us is sometimes we're moving so fast, there's collateral damage. As a leader, you know, and, and I think 
I, what I've watched, because I love watching, yeah. uh, what I've watched is I think you have a similar dynamic that I do, which is, you know, obviously when you're in the lead position, your team is always gonna have to be deal with the reality of like, okay, that's our leader. Like we're gonna have to deal yeah. with that. But, but I think it's palpable on your team as it is with mine. Yeah. How do you think about having an entrepreneurial spirit in a corporate environment where inevitably a lot of the people that work for you yeah. are a little bit more structured. Every T and I is crossed. Yeah. You know, speed is sometimes the enemy. And they, I think you and I probably put speed on a pedestal, yeah. whereas other people sometimes misinterpret it as being sloppy. Yeah. What I think we look, we counter with like, but we focus on what actually matters. Totally. You know, how, how's that dynamic yeah, it's, play out? It's, it's tricky because I think <laughs> like you, um, I care deeply about team. I do a lot of offsites, team building, you know, self-discovery stuff and we go do all this crazy stuff and really want to form a bond to mm -hmm. really make sure we have a shared vision. I think the first step is making sure everyone is subscribe to like what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Do you get why? Do you get where we're going? Are you bought in? And how do you feel like you actually can contribute and connect to this and build upon that? So that's one thing that I think is paramount. Two is it all starts with trust as a team. And so making sure also people understand each other. You know, the other thing I talk about is, um, you know, a lot of people, I want everyone to feel comfortable bringing them whole self to work, right? And yeah. connecting as real people, not just as work people, you that's know? Right. Um, and so I think making sure we kind of break down some of those barriers and build the trust to get to this idea of high performing team. I think once you get that going, then you have a good shot to really do whatever you Anything. need to do. I think the question is, is in a big corporate environment like PepsiCo, um, to your point, folks like me and you, we're, we're boom, 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 we're moving quick, we're thinking, we're spitballing ideas, throwing stuff out. Um, sometimes, and again, it's, it's a trained muscle, you know, sometimes you got to break a few eggs to kind of make some omelets, right, and get it going. And so. Um, every now and then, there's some times where we're like, hey, go, 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 and it's like, oh, well, we can't do that because legal said this, oh, we can't do that because of this, and it's like, and I'm trying to instill, hey, I don't need all those things to always boil up to me to help kind of duke it out with our, some cross-functional teams or figure out what we can and can't. Three, I wanna... for, three for 10 is the Hall of Fame. That's, that's exactly, 300, right? Cal Ripken so... Jr., Eddie Murray. Totally. You know, these iconic Oreo players. <laughs> Todd, what, 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 uh, the what, what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what do we want to uh, end with? What, like, like, for everybody who's listening, we, you, have a, you, have a, you have a slew <clears throat> of different psychographics on my yeah. show. You have a ton of young, aspiring, but, and an awful lot of people more in our age group that, yep. that I do think wish their DNA was a little fast and a little more spontaneous. Like anything, anything kind of last parting shot for people that are trying to get into a happier place or I trying to it, accomplish more? Yeah, and I think I wouldn't even connect it to any of this stuff on, on Pepsi or anything like that. What I, what I would say is kind of more what we were talking about earlier is that if you, it's kind of, life is what you make of it, which I know is the most cliche kind of thing out there, but it's this idea, I tell everybody at Pepsi, I, I mentor a lot of younger folks and people who are just coming in, and a lot of people um, see, see the world as it's presented to them, not as it is, right? So they'll get a job and say, well, my job description says whatever. And I'm like, every job I've been in at Pepsi, I've kind of not, not rewritten completely, but you make it your own. What is your take on it? What are you gonna bring to this? Then what are you passionate about? As you connect the dots, don't always ask and just say, you know, here's the things that you need to do here, boom, 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 boom. Like, what can you do to kind of make your job your own? It's kind of it like, it's hands. kind of like brand marketing, right? All, every brand's, big brand's, you know, sentence or mission statement is so vague what? that how you interpret going for it or doing it for one time or yeah. the life beyond the life or whatever yeah. it might be. Totally. That's complete interpretation. Well, and it's, I mean, case in point, when I, when I came into the water business, right, it was like, hey, we sell Aquafina, we got yep. our play, we got the segmentation yep. done by whatever. And I was looking at it and I'm like, it feels like, but I'm looking outside, I'm seeing an explosion oh, of premium water. I'm, yep. seeing, I'm seeing, I'm like, this, some, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, right. Like Maybe we should take a step back and rethink it. And so, kind of saying, like, if I'm leading water, so let's turn it on its head, let's come up with a new thing, let's come up with some new brand. And so it's like, don't be afraid to push or question the norms just because they're presented to you. Like. See the world as it is, not how it's presented to you. And deal with the ramifications. And with that, yeah. right? Which is like, and if you sucked and you innovated crappy water and you got fired, what? You can always go do something. Like honestly, like yeah. at some level, like one of the biggest ways I think that I've been able to help my friends <laughs> and then employees like f do things yeah. is just push them very heavily on what? What will happen? Yeah. You'll get fired? Okay. Well, that sucks and that's bad. Do you have any savings? Yeah. You know, and sometimes the person's like, yes. I'm like, 
you know, and I'll really go into it. They're like, I'm like, wait, you have three years worth of savings totally. and you're not trying to push the envelope? You can get fired and chill for a year and still be okay. Other people are in debt and they can't, maybe you can't push as hard, but while you've decided to push in your organization, right. you're interviewing outwardly just in case you do get fired. Like, what, what? Right, what's this idea? And it's, it almost goes back to, you know, when I was playing tennis growing up, I was a competitive tennis player. My dad used to always say, cause I would be a head case sometimes, play to win, don't play not to lose. And I would get into this defensive mode where that's what tennis is. I, I would, hate being I would defensive literally be the classic. I'm up five one, and I would lose seven five. Because really? Because I would be like, I wouldn't be thinking. I'd be having fun. Big, I'd be big, kicking big, egg. big shout out to Nate Schroeder uh, on my team, who's who's led me five two three times <laughs> and has lost seven five all three times. But that's but that's but that's the deal. It's kind of like right when you start realizing like shit, I'm I'm killing this guy right now. I'm I'm going. I got this. And then I get in my head and I'm like. Don't mess it up, don't mess it up. Time. And then I change my strategy, I start locking The whole team's like, pushing me, we gotta run, but sorry. I gotta tell you, no, no, you but don't that, be but sorry. That, but that's totally the There's, deal. They need to be sorry, because I gotta say this. <laughs> There's something crazy about tennis. Out of all, like, yeah. I, out of all the places on earth that I've navigated my life, it's the only place where I can get defensive. There's something crazy about being up 5-1 and losing that second game Starting to like visualize the comeback. Totally. Then five three comes. Now you're serving up five three. You should cruise into this. Totally. God forbid you lose that game. It's five four. It's definitely now five no. five. The second it gets to five four, you, you've you lost. understand this? It's, it's totally. Like you react. Like you. That's yeah, the deal. There's something about. It's so real. Not even ping pong. Not even other places. Something about that it's, six. It's the mental flip, it. and so play to win, not not to lose. Todd, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thanks, G. Appreciate thanks for everybody listening. Cool. We'll continue with this. Thank See you. Ya.